So this morning, we are in part four of our series, Miracles, as we have looked at different miracles of Jesus. And the big heart behind all of this, kind of the intentional design of this is let our faith be stirred, let our faith be challenged, let our faith believe that God is still able. Because what we know about Jesus is that he has not changed, that we serve a God who is the same yesterday, today, and forever. And he still does miracles. And so as we've walked through this, we've been in the book of Mark every single week, and, and we'll continue in the book of Mark today in chapter 10, because we've looked at different miracles of Jesus healing a deaf mute, of calming the storm, uh, and then carrying on. We've seen this week, we're going to see as Jesus heals a blind man, as he steps in and intervenes and does an incredible work. Before we get into that, I, I want to again encourage you to be here next Sunday. Some of you are going, Pastor Ryan, you worked really hard to encourage us to be here this Sunday. Why do we need to be here next Sunday? I'm going to just encourage you. Two weeks in a row is not going to hurt you. It's going to be good for you. It's going to be real good to be in the house of the Lord together. And in this service, I'll be honest, I'm pretty much preaching to the choir. I think you see a lot of consistent faces, which is great. First service, though, man, I'm just kidding. That's a joke. I don't, don't tell them I said that. No, I encourage you to be here next week because I believe this, that when God works, when God moves, we need to celebrate that. We need to give the Lord praise. Every time, let me, let me encourage you in this also, and we'll reiterate this as we, as we teach today. Whenever a miracle is done, it is not just for our benefit. If God does it because of his mercy and his goodness towards us, but it is for his glory. And as such, we should give him praise and we should give him honor when the Lord works, when he speaks, when he intervenes, when God shows up, when he moves. We need to give praise to the Lord. Next Sunday is intentionally designed to just celebrate everything God's been doing. It's gonna be awesome. Part of what we're gonna be doing is we're gonna be signing checks for the miracle offering uh, that, we, that we're gonna take up, that we've already started taking up. We're gonna sign checks next Sunday in service and it's gonna be crazy. It's gonna be wild. I'm probably gonna cry because you know I'm, I'm fairly emotional human being and I cry all the time. And so I'm probably gonna sign checks and be weeping. And it's going to be good. And you can laugh at me if you want to, but I get excited and the Lord's going to do great things. So I encourage you, be here next week and, and then enjoy the breakfast tacos with us. So that's not a bribe. That's just a statement of fact, right? Like come enjoy. Today, we're going to be in Mark chapter 10. Mark chapter 10. If you have your Bibles, I encourage you to open them. If you have your phone, open the Bible app. Uh, at this point, I'm sure it's just, you know, comes in, installed. I'm just kidding. It doesn't. Uh, Mark chapter 10. We're going to look at another great miracle of Jesus, starting in verse 46. It says this, Then they came to Jericho, as Jesus and his disciples, together with a large crowd, were leaving the city. They're on their way out. A blind man, Bartimaeus, which means son of Timaeus, was sitting by the roadside begging. When he heard that it was Jesus of Nazareth, he began to shout, Jesus, son of David, have mercy on me. Many rebuked him and told him to be quiet, but he shouted all the more. I mean, you get a little Bartimaeus in our spirit today. We'll get to that. Son of David, have mercy on me. He said, be quiet. And he was like, forget you people. And he shouts. And Jesus stopped and said, call him. So they called the blind. Cheer up. On your feet. He's calling you. Throwing his cloak aside, he jumped to his feet and, said to G and, and came to Jesus. What do you want for me to do for you? Jesus asked him. The blind man said, Rabbi, I want to see. Go, said Jesus. Your faith has healed you. Immediately he received his sight and followed Jesus alongside the road. Let's pray. Jesus, today, God, I pray that you anoint my words. Let it, be, let it be your words as we teach your scriptures, as we teach the very words of the Lord this morning. God, I pray that as we communicate the scripture, God, that our hearts will be open, that our faith will be activated, and Lord, that I will speak your truth today in Jesus' mighty, mighty name. Amen, amen, amen. There's a few things that we want to point out today as we walk through this. Uh, I have some points, and we will we'll hit those points as we walk through, but there's so much in this text that I think that we need to expound on and kind of look at as our faith is, is increased and developed this morning. Amen? Yeah. That's a good, man, y'all see, preaching to the choir here. Like, y'all are with me. It's good. The first thing is this. He was persistent in discouragement, in his discouragement. Bartimaeus, he's sitting there on the roadside and all of a sudden he's begging and he's right there and there's a crowd that is coming. Jesus is making his way towards Bartimaeus as he sits on the roadside and he begs and he hears the crowd and the commotion and gains the understanding of what's going on. And he's like, oh my word, Jesus is coming. 
This guy, Jesus, is making his way towards me. So what does Bartimaeus begin to do? Naturally, he begins to shout and begin to say, son of David, have mercy on me. And he's crying out and he's calling out. And what does the crowd do? Be quiet. Stop. This, he's not here for you. Stop. Be quiet. And I love the response of Bartimaeus is that he just simply just goes, son of David, have mercy on me. In the discouragement, in the moment when, when nobody is, 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 is encouraging him to keep shouting, nobody's going to his aid, no one's running down the street to grab Jesus to bring him to him, nobody's trying to work to carry him to Jesus, he doesn't have the friends of the lame man being lowered through the roof, right? He's in a position where he's stuck, confined to himself because of the blindness, sitting on the side of the road begging, and the crowd turns to him and says, be quiet, be quiet. And I love just kind of the attitude that he has towards him. And he just goes, son of David, have mercy on me. Listen, today we need a little bit of that in us. Because there are times when we've maybe gone to Jesus and we've cried out and people begin to come and say, you know what? Maybe the Lord's not going to answer that prayer. Maybe you need to move on. Maybe you need to forget about that. This isn't what the Lord wants to do. It's not his will. Stop asking. Uh, it just, you need to let it go. Have persistence in your faith. Have some persistence in your faith to say, you know what? When others discourage me or when discouragement arises, I'm going to be persistent. I'm going to speak up. I'm going to stand up. I'm going to shout out to the Lord and say, oh, Lord, I have mercy on me. Have mercy on me. Extend your mercy towards me. Extend your spirit towards me, oh, God. Holy Spirit, come and speak and move. Do what you can in my life. I need a miracle, Lord. I'm going to shout to the Lord. When everybody tells me to stop, I'm going to keep shouting to the Lord. He says, have mercy on me. Have mercy on me. There's more than just a simple request of healing from this blind man. There's a recognition of who Jesus is in this moment. He says, son of David. This is essentially saying Messiah. He said, Messiah, have mercy on me. As he's crying out to the Lord in the realization of this isn't just some rabbi. This isn't just some teacher. This is the son of David. He says, have mercy on me. Have mercy on me. And today, maybe you've been in a moment where you're the one discouraging yourself. As you go, man, I've prayed for this, and I've prayed for this. I've cried out to the Lord. I've cried out to the Lord, and he just doesn't seem to want to hear. He doesn't seem to want to answer. Get some persistence in you. Get a little Bartimaeus in your spirit this morning that says, shut the voices out. Tell the voices to quit. Say, sorry, you know what? I'm not going to listen to you. I'm going to keep on keeping on. I'm going to keep going to the Lord. I'm going to continue to ask. I'm going to continue to pray. I'm going to continue to run to the Lord. Even when the voices around me say to quit and to give up or to move on, I'm going to say, no, I'm going to hear from the Lord. I'm going to go to the Lord in prayer. I'm going to go to the Lord in prayer. Listen, I want to encourage you this morning that there is never a wrong time to pray again. There's never a wrong time to ask again. There's never a wrong time to go to the Lord again. Keep shouting. Keep going to the Lord. Keep leaning on Jesus and say, Lord, regardless of what everybody else says, regardless of what I've told myself, I'm going to be persistent. And here's the other thing. He was persistent when Jesus didn't respond. He calls out to Jesus. He shouts. And the crowd is like, shh, shh, be quiet. Jesus didn't respond in that moment. He had to shout again. And sometimes what I've seen and I've found even in my own life, in my own experience, like we see with Bartimaeus here, perhaps in this moment, Jesus is testing the faith of Bartimaeus. He said, are you going to shout again? Or are you going to be discouraged and give up? Because it wasn't the first time that he called out that Jesus responded. And maybe you've got things that you're like, I have cried out to the Lord and cried out to the Lord and cried out to the Lord. He just doesn't want to answer. Be persistent in discouragement. When the, Lord, when the world tells you no, stop, stop asking. Or when God doesn't respond, be persistent in discouragement. Sometimes you, you, you got to just kind of have some of that, that spirit of David in you, right? Not that there's a spirit of David. Hear me, follow track with me. The mindset of David that just says, command my soul. He says, oh, oh soul, you know, praise the Lord. Sometimes you got to get some of that in us and say, oh, soul, cry out to the Lord. Pray again. The Lord may not have responded the first time, but that doesn't mean he's not going to respond if you remain persistent in discouragement. You gotta remain persistent. He says, have mercy on me. 
I, I want to sidebar just for a moment here with this thought and this idea. If you, you might say, I've never seen a miracle. I've never seen somebody healed. I've never seen the provision of God. Let me encourage you, if you have seen someone give their heart to Jesus, or if you've received Christ, you've experienced and seen the greatest miracle the world will ever know when the grace and the mercy of God is extended to the repentant sinner that comes to the Lord and says, forgive me, Jesus. Be the Lord of my life. Come into my life. Guide my life. I confess that you are my Savior, that you are. That is the greatest miracle you've ever seen. It's the greatest miracle you can ever experience as life is, ex- or as death is exchanged for life. The greatest miracle you'll ever know, the greatest miracle you can ever see. And he says, have mercy on me. Extend your mercy to me. Extend your mercy to me. He remained persistent. He remained persistent. I, I love that the point here that we see in this miracle is the glorification of Jesus in front of the crowd. He says, son of David, have mercy on me. He is calling out to him. He's claiming you're the Messiah. You are Lord, essentially is what he said. You, Jesus, the name of Jesus glorified in the moment. This miracle bringing glory to Jesus. This miracle raising the faith of those around. Yes, it's a great moment of mercy extended to Bartimaeus, but it is about Jesus. And it must be about Jesus. We need persistent faith. Faith to keep going back and going back and going back to Jesus. The second thing is this. His persistent shouting got Jesus' attention. This reminds me of the parable that Jesus used to teach on prayer in, in Luke chapter 18. And it's the parable of the persistent widow. It's a really great parable. And we have it in, in Luke chapter 18, verse 2 through 8. It says, in a certain town, there was a judge who neither feared God nor cared what people thought. And there was a widow in that town who kept coming to him with a plea, grant me justice against my adversary. For some time he refused, but finally he said to himself, even though I don't fear God or care what people think, I will see that she gets justice so that she won't eventually come and attack me. This is, man, this is good. And the Lord said, listen to what the unjust judge says. And will not God bring about justice for his chosen ones who cry out to him day and night? Will he keep putting them off? I tell you, he will see that they get justice in quickly. However, when the son of man comes, will he find faith on the earth? Persistent shouting got the attention of Jesus. I I love this parable as it it gives such a great image to us of this woman who just keeps going to the judge, right? And he's like, she keeps, she's bothering me. The judge is annoyed by this widow woman. She's like, hey, come on, help me with this guy. Fix this problem. Help me with my adversary. Give me, give me justice with my adversary. Give me freedom from this problem. Give me, come on, I need today. Come, coming back. If you don't do it today, I'm gonna come back tomorrow. And if you don't do it tomorrow, I'm gonna come back the next day and the next day and the next day. And he's going, if I don't do something, this woman is going to eventually attack me and I just can't deal with this right now. Have you ever dealt with somebody like that? Just persistent, just doesn't stop, just keeps going, repetitive over and over and over and over. They're usually about three years old. They're called children. They usually refer to you as mom or dad or some derivative of that name as their level of speech may be at different places. We have a great video uh, in our home of our youngest son who turns 11 tomorrow, uh, which is wild and mind-blowing. And those of you who've known him for a while are going, how is that possible, right? But when he was about two or three years old, we have this video where my wife is doing something with our oldest son uh, and she's helping him. And you hear Boston in the background literally just repeating, ma, ma, because that's what he called her, ma, uh, ma, ma. Ma, ma, ma. And she's like, okay, hold on one second. Hold on. Ma, ma. Yes, hold, just a moment. Ma, ma. Okay, what do you need? You know, it's like in one of those moments of like, this is that persistent moment of going and asking and asking and asking. And ultimately, eventually, Lauren was like, yes, my sweet child. What do you need? And it's that great moment, right? And here's what, the, here's what Jesus is telling us. We can do the same thing with the Lord in prayer. 
The Lord isn't going to go and just be like, would you stop already? And just like, see ya, right? It's not how this works. It's not how this is happening. The Lord is saying, keep coming, keep coming. See if I don't respond. See if I don't turn to you. See if I don't ultimately, you know, you get my ear. See if I don't say, call him to me, call her to me, bring them to me. See if I don't eventually hear the cry. Here's what I love about this parable in Luke chapter 18. As you read through the rest of Luke chapter 18, you see this very story of blind Bartimaeus from Mark chapter 10 at the end of Luke chapter 18. And he's just shared this story of like, she went day after day, after day, after day, after day, going to hear from the judge. And he ultimately turns and hears. And then we see at the end of this, Bartimaeus calling to the Lord that everybody tells him to be quiet. And what does he do? He calls to the Lord again. His persistent shouting got his attention. If you want to get the attention of Jesus, continue to go to Jesus. Continue to shout to Jesus. Don't let it just become a thing where you go, I prayed that one time and he didn't listen. And so I just moved on. Sometimes God wants to stretch us a little bit, to push us a little bit. We can't be easy quitting Christians. If, if we have the desire or the mindset that says, well, you know what, I can, I can try once and move on and it'll be just fine. We will never make the progress God has called us to make. We will never see the miracles that God wants to show us because we give up too quick. We give up too easy. We live in a world that wants it now. We want immediate response. We want things done yesterday. Y'all know the world I'm talking about. You live in it, all right? We, we, we share these thoughts all the time. It's like, if you text somebody and, and you go, you see the little dots pop up, you're like, they better be responding to me and not just looking at it and closing it. And then the dots go away and you're like, tell me right now, respond right now. I wanna hear right now. We're all the same way. Don't act like you're not that way. Cause you know, on the inside, you're like, wait a minute, I saw the three little dots. They were typing. The bubbles went away you get that struggle and you're like, right? We want it now. We want to hear now. And so when we go to the Lord and we ask the Lord and we pray and God doesn't respond the first time, it's kind of like, Lord, you're not working on my timeline here. What if Bartimaeus would have said, son of David, have mercy on me. And he doesn't respond. And he used to sit there and be like, fine then, forget you. Jesus would have said, okay. And kept walking. But he says, that, no, no, that wasn't good. I'm, I'm going to shout again because maybe he didn't hear me the first time. The crowd is loud. There's commotion. And he says, son of David, have mercy on me. And Jesus says, whoa, call him. Call him to me. Bring him over. Don't you, <laughs> don't you love the hypocrisy of the crowd? It's so good. Shh, quiet. Be quiet. Sit there. Be, you're a little beggar. Be quiet. And all of a sudden, hey, cheer up. Come on. Hey, he's calling you. Don't you know there was that one person that was like, here, let me walk you to Jesus so that he could see me walking you to Jesus. Like all of a sudden you went from the guy that was shouting and being like, stop it, to yes, Lord, look, I'm bringing him, right? That's another message for another time. Don't be that person. Okay, that's another deal. But his persistent shouting got the attention of Jesus. And I love how Jesus responds. Blind man clearly was probably helped and walked to Jesus, probably kind of feeling his way around, being led by others. And he gets in front of Jesus and Jesus says, what do you want me to do for you? And if I'm the blind man, I'm going, is it not obvious? I can't see. But perhaps Jesus knew something we don't know. And I try not to read too much into the text. I try not to read too much into the scripture, but, but I, part of me wonders, why would Jesus ask this question when clearly the obvious need is the sight to be restored? Maybe there's something more to the statement Bartimaeus made when he said, son of David, have mercy on me. Maybe Jesus saw his faith and knew that, that he believed and knew that God was able to do so much more than just open eyes. He was able to do so much more than just open deaf ears. He was able to do so much more than just raise a girl from the dead. He was able to do so much more than just cast demons out of, out of the possessed. He was able to do so much more than just miracles. So Jesus says, what do you want me to do for you? What do you want me to do for you? His persistent shouting got his attention. The third thing, but Jesus healed him because of his faith. Jesus healed him because of his faith. He comes to him and says, what do you want me to do for you? And Bartimaeus, standing before Jesus with the most simplistic 
of responses the world could ever see or know. And he just says, Rabbi, I want to see. I want to see. That's it. I just, I know you can. I know you're able, and that's what I want. Sometimes I think that in our response to Jesus, we don't make our, our, our request known plainly and clearly, and, and we complicate faith when it's just this simple faith stated to the Lord. Like, hey, here's what I need as we just boldly approach. Look, here's what happens a lot of times. We come to the Lord and we begin to pray like this, and, and, and I'm gonna explain myself as I go through this, but you come to the Lord and like, Jesus, uh, God, I love you, Father. Um, I have this, this thing you know it because you know all things. You know where I'm going with this. But God, uh, if you're able in the moment, if you're willing, Lord, I ask it. And if it's, if it's your will, if it's your will, Lord, I ask that you come and you, if it's, if it's in, not inconveniencing you in this moment right now, would you oh, uh, open my eyes? One eye's fine, but both eyes would be great. Here's what, Here's what we run into. Is it wrong to pray and ask for the will of God to be done? No, no. But here's what I know about the Lord. His will will be done. We are not going to affect or change the will of God. The Lord is going to make the will of God happen. He can choose to use us to make the will of God happen. So when we come to the Lord with our request, we don't have to tiptoe or kind of dance around the issue or the problem. First of all, he knew that the man was blind. He knew sight being restored was probably on the table of requests, but he made it cl clear and plain. It's just a simple boldness to his faith. We are told that we can boldly approach the throne room of heaven. We can boldly approach the Lord and make our requests known to him. We can come to the Lord and begin to say, God, you see the need. I need my eyes open. I need my sight restored. I need to be healed. And, and I don't have to, to tiptoe around the issue or, or kind of appease the Lord in my request. But sometimes I think he loves when our faith is simple enough to just say, hey, you can. Will you just do this right now? You see the need. Uh, God, hey, uh, this bill's coming due, and I really just need a really awesome miracle if you could just make that happen. I'm going to go check the mailbox. If you put a check out there, that'd be really great. And I say that because I remember a time, I say I remember, I was two. I don't remember, but I've heard the story enough times. It's like I remember. My parents were pastoring a small church in Hallsville, Texas. And uh, the time was coming, Sunday was coming in small church, East Texas, very little money coming into the church, and the electric bill was due. Meaning if it didn't get paid on Friday or Saturday, there would be no electricity for Sunday. And as calendars go, Sunday was coming regardless of whether or not there's electricity in the church or not. Y'all understand how that works? We see that we're processed. Okay, y'all are smart people. I don't know why I have to ask. And so as, as they be, my dad goes to the church. He's like, I've got to pray. Uh, I don't know what we're going to do. There's no money in the checking account at the church. The church was really small. My parents had just gotten there. My dad was pastoring as a child. Uh, in case you're wondering, he was like 24 years old pastoring this church. And y'all are thinking, well, that's, that was their fault. They voted him in. And so <laughs> the church did well. The church grew and ultimately got, okay. And he goes to the Lord and begins to pray. He had already gone to the mailbox, the P.O. box of the church and checked and it was empty. There was nothing in there because it was one of those moments like, Lord, if it's here, yes. No, it's not. Let's go pray. And he goes to the church and he begins to pray. And while he's praying, the mail has run for the day. And the Lord spoke and said, go back and check the mailbox. And he was like, God, I did that. Maybe you weren't paying attention in that moment. Like it's the one time you didn't know what was happening in my life. I went and checked the P.O. box, right? And he said, my dad tells this story. It's so great. He's like, I had this conversation with the Lord. Like, why would I go back? I did this. This is what I've done. And the Lord said, go check the mailbox. And so he goes back. He drives to the, to the P.O. box, to the post office, opens the P.O. box. And there in the P.O. box is a check for, to the dollar, the amount the electric bill was for the church, right? God showed up and did incredible things. And here's what happened. My dad prayed a specific prayer. Lord, I need a miracle. And now he kind of wrestled with the Lord on it and how the Lord wanted to do it. And we talked about, don't worry about the methods, just let Jesus speak and make it happen. But he showed up and he went. And here's what I found. Here's what I love about this. Bartimaeus in his simple faith, catch this, understand this. He had never seen a miracle. He was blind. There was nothing visual for him to see. He had never seen Jesus. 
He had only heard the stories. He had only heard the accounts of the incredible miracles Jesus had done. He had only ever seen in his mind's eye what Jesus could have looked like or the miracles that were happening. But he hears the stories. He's hearing what's happening. And that was enough for his faith to rise up within him to say that Jesus that is coming this way is the Messiah and he is able to heal me. And I have enough faith to believe I can just say, I want to see. I want to see. Open my eyes. Open my eyes. Man, I wish there was a verse that talked about faith not being about what we see, but the fact that maybe faith is something about like the confidence of what we hope for, or perhaps the evidence of things unseen or the things not seen. And we have this man, Bartimaeus, that's in Hebrews, in case you're going to look it up. It's Hebrews chapter 11. Okay. They have this man, Bartimaeus, who comes to the Lord having never seen a miracle. He's only believing what people are saying. He's hearing it. He's hearing the stories. He hears the commotion coming down the street. The crowd is coming, and he says, that's the man that can heal me. That's the man that has my miracle. That's the man that can open my eyes. Son of David, have mercy on me. You know, I've never seen a miracle. I've never seen God provide. I've never seen God open the doors. Man, I I could tell you story after story. When I was young, same church, Hallsville, Texas, my parents pastoring this church in East Texas, real little, and having no money. Again, the church had no money. That seems to be a reoccurring theme in the early days of that church. No food in the house. It's me and my sister. I'm about two years old. My little sister's probably, my older sister, rather, is probably around five years old uh, or, or 12. She's much older than me, so just... She's not here to defend herself, so it's easy. She's an easy target right now. No food in the house. And it was Sunday night church because it was the 80s. And that's what you did in the 80s. You went to church on Sunday night. We did it in the 90s too. And my mom comes in. She's about to go home. My parents drove separate because my dad's going to lock up. My mom comes walking back in crying. And my dad, as the pastor, immediately thought, somebody upset with me said something to my wife. And he was ready. Who was it? And she goes, I can't get in the car. And my dad said, what do you mean you can't get in the car? She says, it's full of groceries. Couldn't even fit in the car. My parents had to divvy them up and then take extra trips so that we could also go home as well. We didn't have, you know, the kids didn't have to sleep in the church overnight, you know. Miracle. Even in our own life, you go, I've never seen a miracle. But Lauren and I got to a point early in marriage, we couldn't pay rent. We were eating uh, pancakes for breakfast, lunch, and dinner, because it was cheap and filling, not for the health benefits, but for the fact that it was all we could afford as we were young in ministry trying to make it happen. And we got on our hands and our knees before the Lord, and we began to pray. And we begin to cry out to the Lord. We spent our whole day off in prayer. And it's it's like an unintentional fast. When there's no food, you kind of have to fast. And we begin to pray and cry out to the Lord, God, we need your help. We need your help. We need your help. And the next day, someone comes to us and says, I want to pay three months of your rent, right? There's these moments where God shows up and intervenes. They knew nothing of the situation. They didn't know the moment, but they stepped in. Why? Because God spoke. And you say, I've never seen a miracle. Let the faith arise as you hear the miracles, as you understand that God is still able, that he still works, that he still does. We shared the story of the young girl whose deaf ears were open just two years ago at kids camp, right? Let the faith within you rise up and be stirred because you don't have to see to believe. In fact, faith is believing without seeing. Bartimaeus is proof of that. He was a blind man that Jesus steps up and he says, your faith has healed you. Just a simple boldness. He's shouting to get his attention. And I imagine that when he got in front of him face to face, he just said, I want to see. And Jesus said, you got it. I feel like he called him bud. You got it, bud. (laughs) Patted him on the back. There's not a Greek translation for that. So So it fell off. Okay. God is able. God is able. God is able. I'll invite the worship team to join me. This morning, as we are in what we are calling Miracle Sunday and believing this day for God to do incredible things, believing God to do miracles, we've also been praying for and talking through our our miracle offering. And we're going to pray for miracles in a moment, but 
I didn't want to break up and stop as we prayed and asked God to do great things. I wanted to handle this first. At the beginning of this year, as I was in prayer and asking the Lord to lead us and give us direction for the year, I felt a strong conversation with the Lord where essentially he said to me, can I trust you with what's in your hand? And I know that he was talking to me about the finances of the church and believing that I needed to trust the Lord to be led with, with how we handled the finances of the church. And, and the church has been in, is very blessed. We're in, a, we're in a good position to function and operate. And, and we don't operate week to week, but that we, we've got money there to help sustain and move us forward. And that was security for me. That was a good security blanket for a pastor to know, you know what? If, if something was to go awry and people just decided to stop giving at our church, we didn't have to close our doors in the next few months. We could go for a little while. We could sustain for a moment. And I hang on to that as a security. And I feel like the Lord spoke so clear, like, do you want to open that hand up and trust me with it? He said, let me see if I can trust you with it. And I had this moment and I told you I cry all the time and I'm in here praying and I walk right here. If you've ever been in prayer with me, this is where I walk back and forth. And I just, that's how I pray. And so I'm walking and I'm praying and then I just begin weeping as I felt so strongly what the Lord was calling us to do and asking us to do. And, and, and for a moment, I thought, Lord, we'll just write the checks. We won't even, we won't even ask. But the Lord said, no, no, we're going we're gonna to step out in faith. We're going to challenge the faith of the people to give and to believe for this. And I felt clearly that the Lord said, the beginning of this year, I want you to give $100,000 as a church. And to put that in perspective, that's roughly 20% of our church annual income. That puts it in perspective. And I felt like the Lord said, hey, I want you to give $100,000, but I don't want any of it to stay in the house. I don't want you to use any of it for ministry in the house. I don't want you to use it to fix things in the building. I, I don't want you to use it for, for you know, development for youth ministry or for kids ministry or young, young adults. No, nothing in the house. Everything goes outside of the walls. And I was like, okay, I can, I can get behind that, Lord. Like, this is cool. And he said, and then he started speaking to me. I want you to give $10,000 to 10 different ministries. And last week we had uh, these cards on your seats last week, and we're going to pray through the different ministries today. But, but as we've gone through this process over the last few weeks, we've been praying and saying, Lord, what are you asking our family to give? What are you calling our family to step out and give? And for some, this will be a sacrificial moment. For some, this is a big step of faith because to be honest, $100,000 is a lot of money. I'm aware of that. I'm absolutely aware. And that God's calling us to take a step of faith. And for some of you, $100 is a step of faith. For some of you, $1,000 is a step of faith. For some of you, $10,000 is a step of faith that you step out and you believe. You say, Lord, if this is what you've called me to give, and what you've asked me to give, I want to be obedient. And I want to step out in faith and trust you, Lord, so that we can be a blessing outside of the walls of our church. Outside of the walls of our church. We have these commitment cards that are sitting out on the seats or, or, or they're near you. And for some of you, as we've prayed and gone through this, you know good and well what the Lord is speaking to you when he's asking you to do. There's no place for your name on these cards. This is just simply what we're gonna have you do is write the number on there. We're gonna pray together. And then as you leave, you can set it on any seat. If you don't want somebody to be like, I know who is sitting here. You don't have to, you can put it anywhere you want. We're just gonna gather those because we wanna have an understanding of how much is coming in, how much is coming in. What's going to happen? You know what I mean? So we want to be able to keep a, a, an awareness of what's going on. And in a moment, we're going to pray together and just ask the Lord to speak. Because maybe you're still in this valley of decision where you're like, okay, Lord, what are you asking me to give? What are you asking me to step out and do? What are you asking me to, 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 to add to this, to be able to be a part of this? And then we're going to stand together and we're going to hold those and we're going to pray over every ministry that is going to be a recipient of this offering. And what I love is that we have a wide range of ministries. We've got uh, an international church planner. We've got a local church planner. We've got a, a local ministry that Hope Dallas that just does great things for our, our students and our kids here and not just in tutoring and, and, and meeting felt needs, but pointing them to Jesus and doing all sorts of other things to, to help and enrich their lives. You know, we have that here. But then we also have relief ministry that does work outside of our nation with Convoy of Hope. And they do things all over the world locally. Yes, when relief is needed here, when disaster strikes. But we have so many different things that we're going to be a part of. We have orphan care and we've got water wells and just all these different things as, as the Lord is leading. And so we're going to pray and say, Lord, what are you asking us to give? 
And then we're going to stand together as a body and we're going to pray over the offering together and just ask the Lord to do incredible things with it, to do incredible things with it. So Father, right now, I pray God for every person here. Lord, as you're speaking, as you're leading, and as you're guiding, we ask, Lord, that your Holy Spirit will speak to us and to our hearts what we're supposed to give, what you're calling us to give. And then I pray, Lord, that you just give us the strength to be obedient, to give it in the mighty name of Jesus. Give us the strength to be obedient, to give it. Take a moment right now and just begin to say, Lord, what are you asking me to give? And as you have that number, I encourage you, just write it on that card. As you have that number, write it down. And when you have that, if you would, just with your family, if you would stand with us as you, as you make that, that commitment, as you write that down by faith, say, Lord, I'm gonna do this. If you would just stand with us as you have it so we could pray together as a, as a body, as a family together. I'm gonna pray over this offering. If you're ready, feel free to stand with me. Feel free to stand with me if you're ready. And as we pray, I'm going to pray over every one of these ministries and ask the Lord to use this offering. I'm hoping and believing that this is the exact miracle somebody's needing. Amen. I, I, I'm believing that the True Earn family, I, I hope to hear that they're $10,000 short of what they need to get onto the mission field to get over and to plant their church. I, I'm hoping that the De Jesus that are planting a church down the road, that they're $10,000 shy of, of purchasing something that they need uh, to, to operate and do ministry. Uh, perhaps it's a hiring a part-time. So I don't know what it is, right? I, I'm just hoping that they're going, you don't understand what need this meets. I, I'm believing for this over and over and over and over and over. I hope that they're with Fire Bible. I hope there is some language waiting for a Bible that they're $10,000 shy of being able to make that language happen. I just that the Lord is going to use this truly as a miracle offering, not just not just today and here for our own hearts, but but around the world. Amen. So, Father, in the name of Jesus, Lord, you see the step of faith that we are taking in our giving to trust you, Lord, to be a blessing outside of our walls, Lord, to give it away, to give it away. Lord, we've decided and we said, Lord, we're going to be open handed in our approach to the finances. We just simply want to be the pass through, Lord, that, that the money just comes through and we just send it where you need it. We just send it where it's going. So, Lord, today, I pray, God, for Convoy of Hope. I praise you, Lord, that, that, that they do incredible work in relief ministry. I pray that you use this offering to be a blessing to them, to keep functioning and operating, not just in relief, but also in feeding the children that they feed, the thousands, the hundreds of thousands of kids they feed around the world. I pray, God, that you allow them to continue. Lord, speed the light. Lord, as they put missionaries in vehicles where they're located for the work that they're called to do, whether that's a, a car or a truck or a motorcycle or a camel or a horse, a donkey, whatever they need where they are called. I pray, God, that you use this so that the gospel can be spread far and wide, so that the name of Jesus can go further than it could before. God, we pray for BGMC, that you resource our missionaries with it so they're not having to tap into their own funds that they're trying to live on and to stay and to be there, that we can provide resources that they need to be able to do the work that they're called to do where they are for Fire Bible. Lord, that they, as they translate Bibles, Lord, it takes a million dollars for the first print of every Bible in a new language. God, I pray that our money that we send will be used to see the Bible translated into somebody's native language for the very first time, that we get to place it in the hand of a pastor who's going to preach the word to a church. They're going to preach the gospel. They're going to preach the stories of old and, and share the goodness and the grace of God as your word, your inspired scripture, oh God, is handed to pastors to preach around the world. Lord, we pray for the World Prayer Center. Lord, a ministry designed to pray over and to continue in constant prayer over these ministries, over missionaries, over the work and organizations around the world doing so much as they continue to cover them and bathe them in prayer. Lord, as they spend time and they take teams to be in prayer 24 hours a day lifting up ministries around the world. Lord, we pray that you use this money to help them to continue in their efforts. Lord, for Hope Dallas, God, over Seth and Lacey and the work that they're doing in our own backyard, in our own neighborhood to help families and children right here. God, as their heart to be the church is, is more than just being somebody who helps, but to live as Jesus lived right here in this day and age. Father, we pray that your blessing and your mercy and your hand will be on them. Use this money, God, to see their efforts go forward 
forward to increase in what they are being called to do and what they're being asked to do in the name of Jesus, Father, for the Truern family as they get prepared to go and plant a church in Italy. And they've been told they need $50,000 to make it to be there for four years. So Lord, we pray that this blessing will help them to get on the mission field to plant a church in an area, in a nation that is only 3% evangelical Christian in the name of Jesus. Father, for Africa Oasis, as they work to not just dig water wells, but to provide sustainable water solutions that puts the emphasis at the church. So when the neighborhood, the community, and the village need water, they have to go to the very house of God. I pray that you anoint their efforts use them, God. I pray that through this money that they are able to do more work than they thought possible in the name of Jesus and the De Jesus family as they plant their church, as they launch here in the next couple of weeks down in Lancaster, Texas in a movie theater. God, I pray that this money will come as a shock and a surprise and will be an answer to a specific prayer that they're asking in the name of Jesus. And then, Father, I pray for the Porter family. I pray for them, oh God, as they lead backyard orphans, as they work to connect churches to the foster care system so that that foster children can be brought up in a home, Lord, that is rooted in the Word of God, that is rooted in the gospel, that puts Jesus at the forefront in a home, Lord, that is spirit-led and spirit-filled, God, that is able to be guided and directed to raise these children in the direction of the Lord. Father, use this offering. God, let it not just be a miracle because we call it such, but let it be a miracle because of the effect that it has on the world around us and on the entire world. Father, as we work to help have global impact for your kingdom, God, use this offering in the mighty name of Jesus. In the mighty name of Jesus. Amen, 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 amen. One last thing before we pray for miracles in the body. Outside in the lobby, we have uh, different baskets set up. We don't want to just bless. There's four ministries that that we know the, the leaders personally, the directors personally, and we want to do more than just give them money. Well, we do, they do want the money. They need the money. I, I promise you that. But we also want to send them with encouragement. So there's a place for you to write a letter and just say, hey, thank you for what you're doing or to encourage them. If you feel like the Lord speaks, it's like, you know what? I feel like the Lord wants me to tell you you're awesome. So be it, right? Just write them. Take time if you get an opportunity. Write some notes for them. Drop them in the box. We want to be a blessing in our words as well as financially uh, and to partner with them and say, hey, we're for you. We are for you. We are for you. We believe in you. We believe in what you're doing. And we're thankful for you. We're thankful for what you're doing. And so if you have an opportunity today before you go, write a note. Write a note to, to one or four or all or whatever. And just let's be an encouragement to them. I believe in that. Now we're going to shift gears. We're going to shift gears because I believe this, that we've been talking about miracles. We've been praying for miracles, believing for miracles. And I'll tell you, I, I already had somebody speak to me after first service. They came to me and, and they had been praying uh, with, with battling with depression and, and walking through a dark season. And they came to me and they said, I want you to know that I had real breakthrough this morning and, and, and that God is working and setting them free from depression. Amen. Amen. Listen, I, here's, this is something that we've talked about in staff and that we've kind of, through our prayer time together, that there is a, a man, depression is, is a battle in our church. It is a battle in our church. And I'm just gonna claim this in, in Jesus' name, that it has no authority here, but that Jesus has victory over depression, that there is hope in the Lord, that there is peace in the Lord, there is joy in the Lord, and that depression has to bow its knee to the name of Jesus. And that we're gonna declare this as a place of victory. Uh, and that freedom, there's freedom in the mind. Listen, I understand. And I'm not diminishing and saying that there are not medical issues and real reasons and times to, to medicate with depression. Absolutely not. I, full disclosure, I've been there. I've been medicated for depression. Like, this is not me coming up and saying, if, if you're a believer, you shouldn't be depressed. No, 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 no. Don't, 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 don't go there. Don't do that. Don't do that. But what I am saying is that if you walk through it, our God is able to deliver. Our God is able to bring freedom. He is able to heal the mind. He's able to set you free from anxiety, but he's able to free you from every other infirmity, sickness, injury, uh, whatever you're facing. He's also able to provide. If you say, man, I need provision. I need the Lord to show up and provide. Our God is a provider. 
uh, he's able to provide. And here's what we're gonna do. I'm gonna encourage you. We're gonna begin to pray and, and praise it. Just worship the Lord. And just get our hearts right. Just kind of set our hearts on the Lord for a moment. And then after that, I'm gonna encourage you to come forward. If you have a need, just step forward. Is there anything supernatural or spiritual about the front of this room? Absolutely not. It is not more sacred than the seat that you're sitting in. But what I do know is this, that when we activate our faith a little bit, and we step out and we come to the front, uh, it's like coming to the altar. It's like responding to the Lord and the Lord says, I'm ready to meet with you. And so I, I encourage you, step out, trust the Lord, trust the Lord, trust the Lord. So Father, right now, Lord, we turn our hearts to you. We turn our minds to you, our thoughts to you. We say, Lord, come, come Lord, in the name of Jesus. In the name of Jesus, Father, let our hearts begin to be built up. Lord, let faith arise. Lord, let our faith rise up within us. Let our faith rise up so that we can begin to see you work and move in this place. In the name of Jesus, Father, you see the needs in the room. Lord, you see the needs in the room right now. And we begin to come to you right now with our faith stirred, with our faith stirred, knowing God and believing God, you are able to do exceedingly and abundantly more than we can ask, than we can think, or that we can even imagine. And so, Lord, we ask in the name of Jesus, let faith rise up in this place. Come on, begin to lift your voice. Begin to cry out and say, Lord, let your let my faith line up with your, with your ability. God, let my faith line up with what you're able to do. God, in the name of Jesus, we pray. Let faith be stirred. Let faith be stirred. Come on in this place. Lift your voice. Lift your hands. Begin to say, Lord, come. Come, Lord. In the name of Jesus. In the name of Jesus. Lord, this is a place of prayer this morning. Lord, this is a place of healing. This is a place of provision. Lord, this is a place where your spirit will be poured out and moved today in the name of Jesus. In the name of Jesus, come. Move in this place. Move in this place. If you have a need this morning, begin to come forward. Begin to come forward. Begin to say, Lord, come. just come forward and just begin to worship the Lord. Just begin to say, God, we need you. I need you. I need a miracle. I need your hand in, this, in my life. I need your spirit moving in my heart, in my life today. Let's begin to ask the Lord for miracles. Let's begin to ask the Lord for miracles. Let me encourage you. If you see anyone down front that you want to pray with, you are free to come and pray. You are welcome to pray. I encourage our small group leaders, our elders to come and to pray with others in the room. Uh, our staff, our team, uh, feel free to come forward and pray. Please come forward. Ordained ministers or licensed ministers, certified ministers, come pray if you want to pray. In the name of Jesus, come on. Jesus, we ask you, Lord, move in this place. In the name of Jesus. In the name of Jesus, come on. Let our hearts be stirred. Let our faith rise.
God of the impossible. God, you're a God that answers audacious prayers. You're a God that shows up and does wild things, wild things. I, I want y'all to hear a story that, that Jason shared with me um, between services, just of the Lord answering audacious prayers. And, uh, Go ahead. Oh. I'm going to pray first because I'm nervous. Father God, this is the most cherished memory I have with you. And God, I pray that I can share again at the right time. And I'm going to pray something impossible and say that if you can remove me from this, I know it's part of my story and part of what you've given me, but I pray that my mouth is Somebody needs to hear this. Speaking out in faith. Like a lot of uh, spiritual stories, this was, this was in college. Um, this was near the end of college. I was in a particularly rough place. It was a perfect storm of, of poor coincidences and, and poor planning on my part. I'll save you all the details, but my best friend had just broken up with me. I had lost several thousand emails from my current job, and I was trying to graduate with zero prospects of employment, like none. I was in a dark place, and I was not righteous, and I was not faithful. I was not full of faith. One night in a uh, particularly rough night, I prayed an impossible prayer. And I had been through every church camp. I had been through every service. Um, charismatic, uncharismatic, <laughs> evangelical, <laughs> doesn't matter. I'd been through a lot of it. And I had gotten very adept at being a skeptic and dismissing a lot of the things that God had done. Miracles, if you want to call that. Uh, coincidences, if you wanted to be a little more skeptical. And in that moment, I knew that I did not believe in God the way that I wanted. I was questioning whether he was actually there or not. And so being a skeptic that I was, I prayed an impossible prayer. I said, dear Jesus, I need you to prove to me that you're there, but I can't be involved in it. It's like I was, I, I don't even know how you answer that prayer. It's like I was asking God to put proof in a locked filing cabinet that I couldn't get to, but I still needed it to affect my life. It 
didn't make sense. It did not make sense. And I do not know why I prayed it. I fell asleep that night and I slept walk as I often did. I, especially during periods of stress. I slept walk and I was aware that I was sleepwalking. It happens if you're used to it. I go out to my couch and I fall back asleep. Just any flat surface will do if you're a sleepwalker. I close my eyes and I had a dream. Uh, a dream that was weird. It was pitch dark. The way that your house is pitch dark when all the, when the power goes out. It's the middle of the night, maybe snowmageddon, and and it's it's dark. It's dark, dark. It's it's not a. I can kind of see the glow over there. No, it's dark. I can't see anything. For whatever reason, I knew that I was in a vast room. I would maybe it was a room. Maybe I was out in the desert. I don't know where I was. I knew that something was weird about this dream because when was the last dream you can remember where you couldn't see anything? When was the last dream that you had that there was no visual cues? I had a dream last night where someone was just talking to me and I can remember everything. No, you see, you 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 talk to people, you you feel. I could not see anything. And in the dream, I am walking. I don't know how long I was walking. I was walking in a straight line and I'm I can't see anything. I'm putting my arms out the way that you do in, in your own house and expecting to feel things, but I knew I wasn't going to feel anything. I knew I wasn't going to find anything. I was in vast black emptiness. And if that sounds scary, that's where I was. I reached my hand out for one more step and I reached and I touched something. And this is going to sound strange, but I touched a giant toe. <laughs> I reached and touched a, a toe by the feel of it. Again, can't see anything. Can't see the outline of silhouettes, no nothing. I reached out and touched what I, I could only imagine was a 40 foot high brass toe. It wasn't moving, it was unchanging, but it wasn't cold. And in that moment, I felt an immense comforting humility. Congratulations. You are not the center of the universe. You, you just happened to be wandering in the dark and you reached out and you touched the toe of God. And I woke up from that dream knowing that my impossible prayer had been answered. I was not awake. I was not awake. I was not even there to be a skeptic. And it was in my head when I woke up and when I felt when I had touched God's foot. Y'all ever 800 pound Jesus? This was an 800 ton Jesus. What I felt was not condemnation, it was a comforting humility. I am not in charge. never doubted again because I had been given exactly what I was asked for and my own failing to be reliable and my own tendency to be a skeptic I could not dismiss it because I was not there in that memory I wasn't there in that dream it was a turning point in my life, a rebirth years later I want to say it might have been when we were renovating this building we were here, we were leading small group. Something was said to me, and I thought of that dream because I hold it close to my heart all the time. It's there. It was not dark in the dream. It was not dark. I thought I was in the dark. I was blind. I was blind in the dream. Years went by, I just thought I was wandering around in the dark. No, there's this whole other dimension that I didn't know about. I was blind. Sitting by the side of the road, crying out for an impossible miracle. I didn't read that scripture the same way that you did, where, where he comes up to, Jesus comes up to him 
and you go, that's kind of a dumb question, Jesus. What do you, what do you, what do you want? I'm blind. You know that. That's not a, that's, I, I don't think it's a dumb question. Because what the man's asking for is impossible. Yes, he's Jesus. How many other thousands of people had possibly been healed by him? How many hundreds of thousands of people lived there? Just as many skeptics then as there are now. This man sitting by the side of the road. He hears a crowd of people. Jesus might be here. He starts screaming at the top of his lungs. The dumbest prayer in the world. Come here and give me sight. He didn't know what sight was. He asked for something impossible. And that tiny little shred of faith that was in that in Barnabas was if anybody can make this happen it's him and he did and he saw and he will tell the story he got up in front of churches I guarantee you and told the story about his impossible wish about his impossible miracle I don't have a flashy finish because they don't usually give me a mic Thank you guys for listening. And I yeah. hope that you carry it with you. Thank you. Amen. Amen. Thank you, buddy. Thank you. Here's what I know. If you are spiritually walking in darkness, you're spiritually blind in this season, and you're in that place where you've essentially said, Lord, are you real? I, I, I think full and well that that God just used Jason to speak to you. I don't think that was coincidence or by happenstance that the Lord spoke. And and I'll tell you this, I've known Jason for years at this point. He's never come to me and said, man, I feel like I need to share something. I don't think it was coincidence that in that moment, he was like, man, I need need to share this with you. I I think this is for the church. Let's just stop for a moment. I've already said that the greatest miracle we could ever have is a moment of salvation, that moment when mercy and grace comes, where where sins are forgiven, we're covered in the blood of Jesus, right? We're clothed in in his righteousness, right? We are justified. Like, that's the greatest miracle that we will ever know or experience. And so real quick, if you're here, every head bowed and eye closed, and you say, you know what, Pastor Ryan, that was me. I'm the skeptic. And and God just interrupted this service to speak to my heart. God interrupted this service to, to speak to me, to remind me that I'm here, and I need to surrender my life to Jesus, and I need to say, this is my moment. This is my time when I fully surrender and say, Jesus, you're my Lord. If that's you, just on the count of three, raise your hand. One, two, three. Anybody at all this morning, say, listen, I see one. Anybody else? Anybody else? Can we do this as a church family then? Can we support this one? Can we pray this together and say, dear Jesus, forgive me of my sins. Jesus, I confess that you are my Lord. Lead me, guide me, direct me all the days of my life. In Jesus' mighty name, amen. Can we celebrate the mess out of that? Listen, the the Bible says that when one person gives out, the heavens rejoice. I have uh, my brother-in-law pastors a church down in Midlothian, and he always says they're cracking open the Doritos and Dr. Pepper. I... That's his go-to, I guess, for every party. And so he's like, they're cracking open Doritos and Dr. Pepper right now in heaven and rejoicing. That's Miracle Sunday right there. Man, that's where it is. Listen, here's the other side of that. If, if God has done something today and, and you've received a miracle or the Lord's working something and you feel it happening, God's made it happen, will you let us know those things? Because next Sunday when we celebrate, we want to celebrate it all. We, we don't, we don't want to just be like, hey, we get to give money away. But man, what did God do? What did God do? What did God do? We want to celebrate that. We absolutely want to celebrate that. Amen. I think we should praise the Lord on the way out this morning. Let me pray for you. Father, we love you. And we thank you, God, for this day. We thank you for the work that you've done and for the work that you're continuing to do. Father, I know this, that if you started it, you're faithful to complete it. And so whatever has begun, Lord, we thank you for the work that you have created and what you started in this place. We pray today that we leave this place full of faith as we praise you and we worship you as we go. Lord, let, us, let our faith be stirred for this week to believe you for even greater things on Monday and Tuesday and Wednesday all the way through until next Sunday as we celebrate everything that you've done today. We give you glory. We give you honor for it. In Jesus' mighty, mighty name. Amen. Amen. <laughs>